This is the Wally and Mathot Show, powered by Barhaven Ford. Now here are your hosts, Brent Wallace and Mark Mathot. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Wally Mathot Show, powered by Barhaven Ford. Don't forget to check them out. New inventory arriving daily. And of course, a lot of it to do with BFC Roush inspired custom F 150s, Rangers, and Mustangs. And now the Ford Bronco. Check them out at barhavenford.com or stop in at 555 Dealership Drive in Barhaven. I'm Brent Wallace. He's Mark Mathot, the 13-year NHL veteran defenseman who never played for the Danbury Trashers. It's, I guess, it was just the one sad part of his career that he was hoping he would have got to, eh, Matt? Yeah, well, Wally, I, there's a bit of a correction there because I didn't play for Danbury, but I played for the Syracuse Crunch when Zenon Kanopka was my captain, and we had about six tough guys. So it probably would have rivaled that team. And I, I say that we have Morasti and a couple other heavyweights. We would have been, We would have hung in there with them. Yeah, you had John Morasti who played for the Danbury Trashers. It's interesting you say that uh, off a topic here is there's a quote that they said, like every other team in the UHL when Danbury was playing would bring in their tough guys and try to load up and they'd have like three. The problem was Danbury would have eight, so they just run them out. I'm curious <laughs> then if Syracuse had like six of how good those games might have been or how you might have been able to hold your own against them. Uh, yeah, I was. <laughs> yeah, I know. And I, I always make this joke. It was like a WWE match. Like there was just, there were so many theatrics going on in warmups. Like Morasti was firing pucks off the glass into the opponent's end while they were warming up. And Kanopka's at the bench spraying the fans with water bottles. It was, it was wild, man. And uh, <laughs> probably one of the most fun years I've had playing professional hockey. Okay. Did you feel safer on the ice? Oh yeah. I mean, <laughs> Yeah. And and never mind the tough guys. We had like middleweights like Tom Sestito who played in the NHL, Derek Dorsett, a defenseman whose name was Aaron Rome. Um, and we, of course, we had a bunch of heavyweights too at the time. We had a guy, his, his last, his name was Mike Scroy. We brought him in at one point just to add in, like we didn't even need anymore, but he'd come in and he'd wear this long leather trench coat. And before, like, we're all warming up. We're already there two hours prior. He kind of rolls in a little later. And we had a heavy bag in the, in the dressing room down in the basement of Syracuse Crunch Building at, at the War Memorial. And, and Scroy would just hit the heavy bag for, like, uh, and, and he's kicking it and throwing elbows. And, <laughs> like, where am I right now? Is this professional hockey? But that's just the way it was back then. It was hilarious. I love those old AHL buildings like Binghamton, Syracuse. Oh, they're the best. I mean, they're a oh, nightmare to play in, especially yeah. as a visiting team, because the rooms were just garbage. Like the, yeah. the, the visitors' change rooms were terrible. Sometimes you wouldn't even get hot water in there when you wanted to shower. But I mean, again, it's it it made it fun in that it was, you know, it was an event every time you went into one of these buildings. Uh, one of the reasons we're discussing this, obviously, is because we're bringing on uh, T-Bone from the documentary about the Danbury Trashers crime and penalties. That's coming up a bit later in the show. Uh, yeah. So we look forward to that. But the other thing is I want to talk to you about is this documentary series on Netflix called Untold, in which Danbury is part of it, which is an amazing documentary. But they all are. And then I was curious, as we look back, like sports in itself is a phenomenal thing to watch because it's live theater and you can't replicate it anywhere in the world. Yeah. Uh, sport documentaries have that same kind of feeling the real ones, right? Like not the ones produced by teams or whatever, but the real behind the scenes where they tell the actual story are phenomenal. Um, do you have, I don't know, like a, a list or a top three or something? Like what, what are your favorite sport documentaries? Yeah, like so we, so, so I was trying to run through a couple and there's so many that I feel almost bad if I forget or leave any yeah. out. But yeah. like there was this one called the Don Wall. It's about a, a rock climber and he's also a free climber. His name's uh, Tommy Caldwell, I believe. And it's an insane story where he ends up in Kyrgyzstan and I believe um, some of the soldiers hold him captive. And at some point he has to escape. And I believe he pushes one of these soldiers off a cliff, like literally kills this guy to escape and evades the government. And I guess, you know, finally comes back over back to the U S but that is called the Dawn wall. That was fantastic. Wow. And uh, the other one I could name off a whole bunch, but I think yeah. for me, the most impactful one would have been the last dance I think that would be many former athletes answers when it comes to documentaries only because it's Michael Jordan and um, there's more than one episode. It's fantastic. You can really see the in-depth kind of psyche of, of, of Michael Jordan and what he was like to be around in his competitive level. Um, to me, that would have been probably my all time favorite. And of course, there's a couple more like Icarus, which is the doping scandal in, yeah. in the Russian Federation during the Olympics. And That's I guess all the other, like, and, 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 and I, I'll leave it at this. 
all those untold ones are great. I watched the Caitlyn Jenner one. That was awesome. Um, and then the other one was the Christy Martin, the boxer. Yeah, that was, it's called Deal with the Devil. Unbelievable. It's also on Netflix right now. Yeah. Uh, the one thing about The Last Dance, and it goes the same with like the, the one with the Leafs that's coming out here shortly on Amazon uh, yeah. over the first. There, there's editorial control by the subjects in it. So if they don't oh, like how sure. it's painted, they get to change it, right? But like with Dan Barry, I don't believe that they had. Uh, AJ Galante said he didn't see the episode until it aired on Netflix. Yeah, and that's and that yeah, and that that's the stuff that I prefer. And then right. um, I'll date myself a little. Like there was one called Hoop Dreams where they followed these two kids to see if how their career was going to go, and it was well before there was cameras on phones and all kinds of stuff. Oh, uh, um, who are the right? two players? Who are the yeah, players? Uh, Aggie or Aggie? Uh, I can't remember their. Oh uh, man, I think I know the one you're talking about. Yeah, they're two kids from Chicago. They look like they got a chance, and neither one ended up making it to the NBA. But yeah, phenomenal. Like it's over. It was done over ten years. Like, and then uh, I did like the short game, the the golf one with Anna Kornikova's brother. I think it is. It's really really good. Nice, uh, nice. And those thirty for thirties, like with Terry. All Fox. the thirty for thirties are fantastic. Oh I know. Yeah. I agree. I agree. Yeah. 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 Anyway, so, yeah. There's some good stuff out there. Uh, and I haven't seen Icarus, but it's on my list. It's awesome. And and yeah. there's like this side story in there where there's this Russian scientist that comes forward and starts outing their program a little bit. And apparently, forget his name, but apparently he's still in hiding, like basically under witness protection Wow. Um, just to, to stay safe. It, it's pretty intense. And they have him like coming in and out of the country. It's, it's worth watching. Wow. Lots of stuff to watch. Uh, speaking of watch, keep an eye out for all the BEI trucks. That are in the Ottawa Valley, Bonisher, excavating Inc.com, helping to shape the Ottawa Valley. Go check them out for all your aggregate needs. We're working on a Wally Mathot coupon to perhaps get you a free driveway paving. I don't know if it's going to happen, but we're working on it. Um, that's <laughs> BEI.com. Anyway, um, okay, so coming up, we've talked about we've got uh, Tom Pompicello, T Bone. So here we've got, I went to John Pearlberg for our Pearls of Wisdom, and this week's board we got is fantastic, full of the nonsense that happened over two years. I'll call it nonsense because I don't know that it'll ever be replicated, maybe by the Flyers in the 70s. But here's some of the notes that come from Pearls of Wisdom brought to you by sportsinteraction.com slash volume of thought. Sportsinteraction.com is Canada's odds makers. I'll get, uh, by the way, Matt, are you picking the Giants or the Washington Football Club for this Thursday night football game? Yeah, the Washington Football Club. Um I'm not, I don't really have any favorites in this matchup, Wally. I've barely been paying any attention. It, so you'll have to help it, me out here. If it takes you two years to try and name your football team, I think you're struggling. However, yeah. <laughs> I do think That's that fair. they're going to win tonight. So uh, right. if you, a $10 bet pays you $18.83, uh, just because I went and just made the bet. So anyway, uh, sportsinteraction.com slash volume of thought. All right, here's Pearls of Wisdom. 573, the goal scored was the third most in the UHL uh, in their two year history, they had 118 major penalties in one season with a league high 17 player suspensions. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> I just can't imagine 95 points in the 0405 season. By the way, that's an expansion year, it was the most ever by an expansion team. And this one's 74 fights in the following season. So the 05 06 season, they had 17 different players drop their gloves with at least one fighting major. That's Those wild. are pearls of wisdom. That stuff yeah. is nuts. Yeah, like, I is. can't imagine as a player, Matt, because you weren't a fighter. Like, no, right. And so, going into that building, knowing that you are going to get attacked, has to play in your head. It, well, it does. And I, because when I came up into the American League, we had teams like that, right? Like, like yeah. the, the, the AHL was very physical then. And yeah. um, I'm sure it still is to a degree, but it's obviously changed a little with, you know, with the times. But, the, when you're not a fighter and you're going into a building knowing that you're in for one, it's it can play games with you, right? And, yeah. and, you know, I had to fight. I still did in the American League. Not a lot, but I still did occasionally. But I didn't enjoy it. Some of these guys enjoy it. This is like their bread and butter. This is what gets them paid and puts food on the table for their families. And that makes them that much more dangerous than any other player. So uh, it, it's not always pleasant. So I can imagine that gave them a clear-cut advantage, especially at that level. Yeah, I, I'm just thinking you got you end up playing small, right? You just end yeah. up oh totally bumping pucks. Like I think in a 14 year olds who just start hitting and they're just firing pucks off the glass just to get it. Yeah, out. yeah, you're yeah. hesitant. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, interesting thing to watch is that team play. All right. Uh, now for the pre scout for our guest, brought to you 
<laughs> I just love this guy. Uh, so Tom Pompicello Jr. is our guest today. He's 50 years old-ish, we think. Um, born in the hometowns of Bronx, New York. Occupation. We'll call him a, a businessman, shall we? Yep. Uh he uh, with the Danbury Trashers in 04 to 06, he was an equipment manager slash special assistant. Let's just call him the fixer. He well, he had he had many right. job titles, yeah. right? Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't think he could put them all on the business card. That was the thing, right? So, Tommy, I need you to do that. He was also like the head scout for crying out loud. Um, and yeah. mob connections, we're not quite sure, and I don't know if we really want to know the answer, Matt. No, no, so we and and you could feel a little <laughs> bit of heat occasionally, right? So, I think. You just got to handle it accordingly and, and, and let them speak and see what happens. God love But I think, I think there's a disclaimer here that we need to make sure that people are aware of. There's a little bit of swearing. And so, you know, for sensitive ears, maybe this one is not for you. I don't know. But not, it's not excessive. No, it's not. But I'm saying yeah. he's no, a lot no, more it. liberal with his swearing yeah. than most yeah. guests that we typically have on. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. And we will say that he's not like a typical guest we've had on. In fact, this is our first... Uh -oh. I will call him like celebrity. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure how to add to that. I mean, yeah, I guess. Yeah. But he's a beauty. He was very yeah. outspoken and he's a fun interview, right? He's colorful. Yeah. He speaks his mind. He may not always say things you agree with, but take it for what it is. You know, he's, he's a passionate guy. He was a, a funny friggin' character on the show, on the documentary. So, I mean, it is just, it's, it's, it's there for people's amusement. They can listen in and, and there's some insightful stuff in there just to see how the dynamic works within that hockey club. He is considered a Danbury legend and he's coming yep. up next. We're going to take a short break here on the Wally Mathot show, Wally Mathot show powered by Barhaven Ford. Of course, that's coming up in the Whitewater chat brought to you by whitewaterbeard.ca. Don't forget to shop whitewater.ca and get 15% off using the Wyoming coupon code. We'll be right back after this. All right, welcome back to the show, and welcome in now to the Whitewater Chat, the Danbury legend himself, Tommy T-Bone Pompicello. Uh, T-Bone, great to see you, my friend. It's, uh, it's great to uh, be on your show. Uh, you know, I heard a lot of the good things about you and the, uh, the pylon sitting in the other chair. <laughs> i'm here for all of that so you just want to continue down the road of chirping meth okay do you think meth could have played on the danbury trashers yeah 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 i'll give him that i'll give him that <laughs> yeah, give him that oh see matthew crew wasn't all for i that. know and, well, and, and we're talking to t-bone right now and i'm like i'm not gonna chirp him once today because uh, you know like <laughs> I know, I'm hoping the border protects me between Canada and the U S but no, it's all good. I appreciate that uh, there team owner. I'd love to have planned a chance to play for that team. It would have been a lot of fun. It was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, but when you hit that ice, it was all business, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I felt that I knew what I had to do to get the guys ready. And, uh, you know, we went from there. We went from there. It was uh, it was a ride that I'll never forget. Awesome. Uh, and it was right. Okay, hold on. hold on. I feel like I haven't started this properly. One sec here. There you oh, yeah. We're okay. <laughs> so just, I feel like I'm now part of the team. Like I could have been, I could have been AJ, by the way I look right now. Uh, well, maybe. I don't know. Uh, I think some of that uh, Grecian formula wiped off on the jersey there. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of which, did you seriously put Crisco on the jersey so the opponent couldn't grab on them? Yep. Yep. Oh I used God. to wash them in a, uh, you know, it was a, many years of experimenting. And uh, you know, that's, what we, that's what we did. Okay, okay Timo, so we were to, and, and like, and to, to, to elaborate on that, you guys used to mess with some of the opposing teams and stuff. Obviously, in the documentary, you guys were, you know, we were told at least that some of the doors were welded and, and whatnot. Was there anything else you did, any other measures you did to make life miserable for other teams? Oh, sure. When they would come in at like two in the morning and then go back to the hotel, I would go in and measure sticks. And, uh, you know, when they, <laughs> when they got a penalty, uh, you know, if the guy with the bad stick was on the ice, you know, I, I, I you know, I told the, I told the coach, or the referee, but the, the one that really should have been made it to the documentaries is uh, they would check into the host hotel. Yeah. And I, I was already checked in. And, uh, you know, I would pull the fire alarm three in the morning. So they were out in the parking lot. With it. 
I can I can speak on that because as a player, whenever something like that happened, it just messes your whole sleep, right? So did anybody ever say anything after you'd pull that or like probably not, I'm guessing? No, because I went back to the room and then when they were evacuating, I just stayed in the room and, you know, <laughs> continue, continue watching my porn. <laughs> did you have an alias name that you checked in under? No, they were in Amatuda Hotel. Ah, nice, nice. All right. Team uh, effort. There are a few other things. Uh, goalie gear? Did the opposing goalie gear go missing occasionally? Uh, well, what happened was uh, their floaters on the on the on the chest protector. The floaters got taken off, you know, and <laughs> you know you had to be subtle, but it didn't work too well with the subtle. Yeah, I don't <laughs> think that's very subtle. Uh, so the, uh, the we're talking to by the way T Bone Pumpsell, who is the a uh, key central figure, I guess, in, in this new documentary, Untold Crimes and Penalty, about the Danbury Trashers and the two seasons they were uh, playing from the 04 to 06. Uh, the commissioner of that league, Richard Brussel, or Brussel, uh, didn't seem to like you a lot. Uh, it, are you two buddies? You know, uh, Richard seems to forget, uh, you know, that's what you get from the Midwest. You know, uh, he says, I'm not going to let these guys push me around and this and that. You know, like I said, he, uh, you know, I like Richard as a person, but when it comes to hockey, you know, I have a relationship for him when I was in New Haven, you know, uh, not that any of that really stuff went on, but, you know, Richard, you know, stand up when I'm talking to you, you know. (laughs) So in the documentary, it says you get suspended. In fact, he says the only trainer to ever, ever be suspended because, yeah, I know he, he was very emphatic on that because of his actions but it never says what the suspension length is. So what did you, how long was your suspension? Well, first of all, the title of equipment manager to quote uh, the movie casino, you know, when they were looking for a title, you know, a food and beverage. So, you know, yeah. it was a title, <laughs> it was a title, but you know, we, uh, there was an incident with, uh, with AJ and um, uh, a GM from another team who uh, quite frankly, to this day, he's, I think he's a I think he's a fucking punk and a sissy, and that's insulting punks and sissies, you know. Fair enough. He uh, started chirping AJ in between the uh, benches, and uh, I I said to myself, I better get over there. You know, that's my bread and butter over there, AJ. So uh, yeah, I, you know, I and the funny thing is, I didn't I didn't take the uh, direct route. I went right through the uh, arena around the rink, and everybody was like, "Where's he going?" and when I got over there, I gave I gave this guy some job security. <laughs> okay, so how long's the suspension? Well, he couldn't fire me because he knew, you know, he he could only suspend me, sure. suspend me. So I, I just, you know, gave it a different title, you know. Because then there's you know, there's operate. parts of the documentary that you are standing behind Jimmy Galante, and I'm like, the equipment guy should probably be closer to the bench. <laughs> yeah and a, and a suit and tie you know listen um it, it was it was uh it was a well oiled machine as far as aj jimmy and i you know we were all on the same page my thing was you know i really felt that uh we could beat anybody with the right demeanor when mm-hmm. i mean demeanor you look at the flyer team of the 70s you know they intimidated so, you know, you, know uh, you got, you know, Barber, Leach, Clark. They can put the puck in the net. But I tell you what, yeah. they're going to run you through. They're going to run you out of the building. They're going to run you out of the building. You know, and that's what we did. We ran people out of their own barn. You know, uh, it was the documentary did leave some up, but it was very well done. You know, they didn't mention guys like Bruce Richardson, who was, you know, yeah. that spark plug there. Uh, Doug Christensen, Jeff State, Mario LaRock. I mean, these guys were, you know, heavyweights too. But you know, yeah. when you got like when you got a guy like Winger, he surpassed everybody. You know, uh, Winger and I we had met when I was in New Haven, and he played in Elmira. Fucking hated each other because we had no toughness on New Haven, and then you know uh, I was always chirping him, and then you know we would run into each other, you know, in between the locker rooms, and you know, uh, you know, I'm a guy from the Bronx. I'm not going to let anybody stare me down. You know, like, listen, he probably could. You know, 
probably could give me a good beating. But at the same time, you know, I'm not going to back down from anybody. So he, we really had a dislike for each other. And then when uh, we were putting the team together and I told AJ, I got the perfect guy for us. So I went through, I had a buddy of mine worked at the NHL offices. I was able to get Winger's number. And I called, I said, hey, Winger, it's T-Bone. He goes, fuck off and hung up on me. So I called him back and I said, you know, you know, we are listening. I'm in Danbury now and, you know, we're going to put this together and I want you to come here. Fuck off. Hung up again. So I went back in Jimmy's office and I said, "Uh, we might have a hard time with this guy. Give me the phone. And uh, before you know it, Winger and his wife, uh, Sarah, who's a great gal, were on a flight. And, uh, you know, I met him at the airport. So it was pretty awkward because, you know, but then we became real, real, real good buddies. Nice. Did you hug it out at the airport? No, no, no. But when we got outside, you know, he sort of Cadillac and he was starting to wonder it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> was there a double note, bag of cash? No comment. No comment. That's fine. <laughs> what about, uh, so a good buddy of mine, T-Bone, John Morasti was playing with you guys. And actually, I never got a chance to call him before we did the interview here, but um, what were your thoughts on him and how the hell did you recruit him? There was a guy that uh, was doing some recruiting uh, for the Quebec League and, and John, you know, John was actually at Bakersfield at the time. And I tell you what, John is one tough SOB. Oh, yeah. Know? And he can play. Oh, yeah. He can play game, you know. And, uh, yeah. you know, AJ got a hold of him and uh, next thing you know, he was on a flight here and, uh, you know, Danbury fans loved him. We loved him, you know, and I tell you what, you know, uh, he's he should be proud of himself what he's accomplished. Awesome. He averaged, I think, Great. eight minutes a night in penalties. And in fact, this is the best stat perhaps we have, and that is your team in 0405 averaged 32 minutes a night in penalties. Like, if, how Wait, is that, that, was that, that That was a full – a period, each period, 32 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that probably makes more sense. There were uh, 74 fighting majors in 05, 06, and in 0405, 17 players suspended. Um, did you guys just know whatever you did, there was just going to be a suspension? Yeah, you know, it was the mentality, you know, whatever means necessary, whatever we got to do to win and intimidate, you know. Uh, listen, at this level, yeah, it's about building a team, but it's about building a reputation and having a following. And, you know, that building was sold out every night. And I tell you what, I would never want to be an opposing team playing in the uh, Danbury uh, Treasures building. No, and did no teams, chance. did teams ever adjust to that? Like, would they, would they start bringing in all these tough guys? They started to, but you know, it was, uh, it was, it was really great to watch. You got a guy like Frank Bialois, you know, and, and he, here he is rushing the puck and everybody was just skating away from him. I mean, he was coming through like he was, and, you know, <laughs> he was toe dragging and shit. I was like, look at this. <laughs> yeah, they tried oh. to adjust, you know, and listen, you know, when the, their tough guy would get on the ice, you know, we didn't send out a heavyweight. We would send out a middleweight, you know, uh, you know, and, listen, we had. Each player was able to take care of themselves. You know, it really was. Yeah. Except for Jeff Da. Jeff Da, what a punk and a pussy and a rat. He's a rat. <laughs> rat. <laughs> We're talking about rat. What did Jeff Da do? He knows what he did. He ratted. He ratted. He cooperated. Ah. Rat. Got We're you. We're talking about got you. We're talking about rats. Hmm. Uh, you know where I of- come from? That's that's the lowest form of life where I come from a rat. Yeah, no, there's no chance I'm going to uh, cross you. Um, no, the, we're uh, talking about, hey, can I say it again? Like Iverson? No. We're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so then are you a made man? Well, I make my breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, a, that's another no comment. That's all good. Um, but did I see things? Yes. Am I, was I involved in anything? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. You know? Yep. Uh, Fair enough. Yep. You know, uh, have I ever been arrested? 
I think back in my twenties, I had a couple of bar fights, but uh, that was about it. How, how many meetings with the <laughs> FBI have you had? <laughs> no, 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 no comment. I don't know. And I no never have it. Okay. No, you know what? Okay, T Bone. I wanted. There's a part in the in the show, and it's it's hilarious to me. I, I I'm probably your biggest fan when it came to the show. I was already sending memes out to my buddies and stuff. There's this part where you're talking about coaching, and you know you're throwing <laughs> you're throwing some kids around a little bit, and you're explaining it. So give you a little bit of insight. Like, what's the philosophy here with the young kids and toughening them up on the ice? You know, listen, it's not, not tennis. Did I try to hurt any kids? No. Did I, did I, did I put him through the boards? Absolutely. You know, <laughs> listen, uh, I think my problem was I wasn't looking at kids or students looking at athletes. I was looking at hockey players, you know, yeah. at like West point, they're not building hockey players. They're building soldiers, you know? Yeah. You know, so, uh, I think my, uh, you know, with my learning disability and my lack of self-control <laughs> kind of got the better of me at times. You know, medication, uh, medication and therapy's come a long way over the years. Good, good. <laughs> Which reminds me, I want to go back to actually you. Uh, I think your dad uh, was, worked with the New York Rangers, and then you worked in Hartford, Scranton. You were at West Point, and I know you coached the Pennsylvania Blues. If hockey DB is correct, in the 2012 season, uh, can you give me your hockey background and how you got to end up at Danbury? Uh you know, I, I played junior beer here in the States. Uh, and what had happened was uh, a family advisor wanted me to take the SATs because he had a hook to put me in one of the SUNY schools here in New York, uh, Cortland. Uh, actually, we went and met the coach, uh, you know, and he had seen some tape and heard some good things about me. So I took the SAT and the family advisor said, don't ever embarrass me like that again. You know, the score, <laughs> the score was that bad. <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, a, you know, I went up to, uh, I got an invite up to Kingston. Uh, back then, they were the Kingston Canadians. Uh, skated with them a little bit. Uh, then we, uh, you know, had a tragedy in my family, and I came home, and, and uh, you know, kind of the career kind of ended there. And, you know, I just bounced around a little bit. But then I remembered, you know, I said, listen, you know, my father working in hockey, hockey operations with the Rangers during the 70s, uh, late 70s, early 80s, you know, it, 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 I wanted to stay with hockey. So I was, uh, you know, I said, well, you know, let me become a court manager because he had, uh, he taught me how to show up in skates, you know, and guys like Cal Vatney, uh, Phil Esposito skates, you know, mm -hmm. and I learned on those. Kinds of videos. So wait, you're sharpening Phil Esposito skates. Yeah. Yep. Oh, awesome. Yeah. That's pretty good. Yeah. Now, were I, they tell you, I tell you what, you know, uh, being around those, you know, that young, you know, you, you're very impressionable and, you know, you take everything in like a sponge. And to watch and see how Fred Shiro would coach and the way he would handle the team. That's what I interpret. You know, did I take it to a little extreme check and some of the kids? Yeah. But my mind was so beyond coaching high school, you know. Uh, and, you know, some great Freddie stories too, where I remember, you know, uh, the speeches that he would give, you know. Uh, where, uh, he, well, you know, he, uh, he would come in sometimes and he, he really didn't have to say much. You know, he had Nicolak uh, do a lot of the talking. Freddie was, uh, when he spoke, everybody listened. Uh, you know, sometimes he, uh, you know, when uh, Pat Hickey had to get traded to uh, Quebec, uh, he came into the locker room uh, in the garden one night and he says, all right, uh, Hitch's line starts. And JD turned around and told him, well, we traded Hitch to uh, Quebec. Coach, he says, yeah, I'm just making sure you guys know. <laughs> he fucking <laughs> classic. You know? uh, okay, I want you back to the documentary for a quick second. That is, is the documentary a hundred percent real? Is there any embellishment? No, hundred percent real. Uh, Jimmy is who he is. Jimmy and I have a George Steinbrenner, Billy Martin relationship for thirty years. I've worked for Jimmy in many capacities and been fired in many capacities, and AJ was always putting the fires out. You know? So, so have you made Jimmy Galante mad at you? Yeah, I just saw him a little while ago, and he said, 
I'm really mad at you and I'm not talking to you, but I want to tell you something. So I just saw him <laughs> not too long ago. So is he, Jimmy, is he, let me is tell he, you something. Jimmy yeah. knows he calls me three o'clock in the morning. I'm going to be there for him. I'm yeah. going to be there for him. That's Fair the way enough. it's, uh, and you know, uh, you know, I didn't know who Jimmy was or was or anything about him. And I had taken his son under my wing without even knowing anything. Cause I liked the kid that much. And AJ is just, uh, you know, he's a mixture of his mom and dad. His mom is a sweetheart. And his, sister, his sister is just as sweet. You know, there comes a stigmata with Jimmy. You know, just Jimmy is the Al Davis of hockey. Just Fair win, enough. baby. Just win. Just- oh, and, uh, you know, they brought me in for a reason. I got paid very well. And I did what I, I did what I knew, you know. Uh, you know, a lot of the tricks of the trade I learned from my father, God rest his soul, you know, cutting two feet off the visitor's bench, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's legit because because I always – I'm that guy who would bitch and complain when the benches were too small. So you guys would actively just go out there and cut the bench down a little shorter? Oh, yeah. You know, on a Friday night, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're off and we get back, you know, you light up a cigar. There's a lot of, lot of trouble. You can get into an arena by yourself, you know. So uh, – <laughs> I love it. Oh yeah, so you, you didn't know Jimmy Galante that much before, like they called you to hire you for Danbury, or were you guys well, I know close him. before? Oh, I, I, I knew him very well. I knew oh, okay. him very well. Yeah. So yeah. there's a there's a part him, I work for him. I work for him at his garbage company. Okay. And uh, you know that, and because he saw the way I handled, uh, you know, coaching and stuff, and uh, actually, I asked him for a job. And, uh, you know, and that started the relationship. I think he fired me two weeks afterwards, but, you know, a, a couple of days later I was back, you know. Uh, how does, how does Jimmy <laughs> Galante fire you? Oh, any, any way possible. You know, is it, give me, is, give is me, it, give, all right. Well, for instance, you know, I left West Point and, you know, it's not a lot of money up there. It's just really good clean living, you know, my, my son's mother and, and they, you know, she would shop at the PX and it was really a very prestige place to work. Not a lot of money. So, you know, I went from smoking $6 cigars to smoking, you know, $30 cigars when I worked for Jimmy. So, uh, you know, <laughs> that was the hardest part every time I get, you know, I got fired back then, you know, uh, how did, how, you know, he tell you, he tell you right to your face, fuck off. You're fired. You know, and, and, uh, I, I didn't know, you know if it was this soft, the smooth, like, "Hey, I gotta let you go," or it's like, "Get out of my office right now! You're fired." Oh no, Jimmy played mind games with you. He'll ignore you for a fucking month. He ignored me for a year one time. <laughs> oh my god! So there's a part in the documentary that says it. The TV show The Sopranos is based around Jimmy, and that there's this sign or this sign picture from James Gandolfini that says to the real uh, Tony Soprano. Uh, can you confirm this? <laughs> Me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you. Oh, oh, I thought I thought you were asking that guy behind us the question. Huh? <laughs> you know, we got the power play going, and you know, we're gonna keep it, uh, you know, the cup now. Bucks in deep. Yeah. No, so Bucks yeah, in yeah. deep. Yo, fuck, hey, fuck. <laughs> listen. I love it. Chip it in, chip it out. Let's get the fuck back on the bus. <laughs> Uh, fair enough. Oh, I'll, shit. I'll move on from, from Jimmy Galante then in, uh, so there's a talk, they talk about, are you the, like the fixture guy? If, if the team needed to go out for dinner or if they needed anything that you arranged all that stuff, like I, I actually, what is your title? If you were to make a business card of, uh, your time in Danbury, uh, head custodian, head custodian. Uh. You just took care, like that. you took care of everything, right? If if the player, well, no, I, and 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 I wanted to ask T Bone on that topic. What about so? You, I remember you guys at one point talking about these big meals. So the boys were playing well. You guys would take care of them. What kind of meals are we talking about here? Like, was this always at the same restaurant? Because I we always took pride in having these big ass meals when we were on the road. So I'm curious how you would set that up. You know, being around for so long, you get to know different towns. You know, I've worked and played in this game all over the United States and Canada. You know, yeah. uh, by the way, do you know that the American Salvation Army can be the military Canadian army if there was a war? <laughs> yeah, you heard. Right. 
I'm just not even getting into this. How do I even respond to that? I, I don't even know. <laughs> I love our armed forces. Yeah. So, you know, you know, it, like you said, and, you know, you get some of the guys coming in and, you know, they were pretty impressed because we're so close to New York and, you know, you know, we'd show them around and it was, uh, like I said, they got everything they needed and more just as long as yeah. they won. Nice. Just as long as they, you know, we never took anything away from them if they weren't winning, you know, listen, any other organization, a team, you know, you go three out of two in the week. It's great. You would take that all season, you mm. know, two wins out of three every week. Yeah. Not happening in Danbury, you know, you know, listen, and I, you know, the, we weren't, he wanted the Canadians and the Flyers both because, you know, the Canadians, well, back then they would lose what 17, 18 games a year, you know? Yeah. yeah. And, you know, you know, that was with, you know, if, if Dryden wasn't playing or, you know, they had Bunny Rock on the, the, on the net. I'm showing my age, huh? <laughs> <laughs> You're dating yourself a little bit. <laughs> I, which which little players bit. did you try to acquire that you couldn't make happen? Because I know you were a big part of. Son of a. We got him back. All right. So just so people know, T-Bone, all of a sudden the line went down and T-Bone's back now because the power outage in the Bronx, uh, I don't know what you've done, T-Bone, but I'm going to guess that the FBI is involved somehow. Uh, just a few questions left. One is, uh, are there any players that you tried to acquire that didn't come to Danbury? Uh, Tony Amante, Jordan LaRock, uh, Eric Weinrich. Wait a second. Tony Amonte? Yeah. <laughs> Jimmy, gave a, Jimmy gave me a blank check, and I drove to Philadelphia, and Dave McIsaac introduced me to him over at uh, where the Flyers practice. Wow. Okay. How close was this to being happening? Well, you know, Tony started running towards the car, you know, and I had to open the car door. And <laughs> Oh, it's too good. Um, so Eric Weinrich, Kate, and George, uh, George LaRock. George LaRock. So you guys are still pretty close, right? As a group, like you and AJ and and uh, Jimmy. I don't know who else is part of that group, but you're all still pretty tight, eh? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You know, and uh, you know, Jimmy and AJ. You know, JJ's got the box in. Uh, you know, Jimmy's doing the oil, and uh, I'm opening my own cigar place, uh, uh, Prima Mora Cigar Cafe, uh, here in New York and Jefferson Valley. We've got to get that plug in. Absolutely, you know, nice. And, uh, nice. Yeah. So if you're ever in New York, you know, you not the pylon, hey, come by and have a cigar. Ah, <laughs> uh, see, I appreciate that because I'm. I was just going to ask you if we were to go to perhaps Danbury or anywhere that you're around, would should we feel safe? Do we just throw your name around? Like, hey, no, I'm here with T-Bone. Well, you know, if we when we go to Chuck E. Cheese's, you'll be all right. I don't know about anywhere. It's <laughs> <laughs> a great spot. They have good yeah. video games. Yeah, we got some got some great restaurants. Uh, we got some great sites, and uh, you know, anytime you guys want, you know, and I'm sure uh, that that uh, invitation also goes for the Galante family. Jimmy's a very gracious man and a very giving man as a son awesome I, oh i gotta ask about the birthday party with the all the wrestlers were you at that party when aj i was no. really young no no i, I didn't I, I wasn't at that party no nope, wasn't there i you know i heard oh. the stories about it there you know a funny thing is uh we're talking about a party my son was in little swimmies and uh uh you know him and jared were you know playing all day together and jared's like a big kid and I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, I see a, a kid in swimming. Sw you know, you could ask AJ, flying through the air, tumbling into the pool. He hit the water so hard that his swimmy, one of them exploded. I jumped in with my clothes on. And when I got him, everybody, like everybody was shocked. He's going, oh, Daddy, that was so much fun. And Jared's just standing there, you know? So there was some <laughs> wild parties at Jimmy's, too. Um, hey, quick story. <laughs> quick story. Go ahead. Yeah, no, no. I was no, going to ask go. you about Olgie Oglethorpe, but go ahead. Oh, fuck. So uh, we were, you know, just going through names and everything. And, uh, you know, uh, I said to the coach, I said, uh, Coach Sterling, I says, 
I'm going to, I'm going to tell Jimmy, we got a guy that's going to really, you know, be another one here. So, uh, you know, for days, Jimmy would ask us about different people. And this one particular kid, he kept asking about asking about. So then, you know, like everybody in the whole garbage company kept saying, you know, when we get in this Oglethorpe kid, you know, they didn't know that <laughs> it was a fiction <laughs> character, you know? Yeah. 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 There is, the, you, you know, could have brought the real one in. Yeah, the real one. What's his What's his name, Wally? Yeah, uh, uh, Goldie. 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 Yes. Goldie. You know, that's 20, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 20, Twenty-three. Big Afro. Yes. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Jesus. Imagine. Twenty-two. Uh, Twenty-three. So, <laughs> do you wild. watch hockey now? Yeah, I'm a I'm a hockey fan. Uh, not any particular team. Uh, I enjoy the sport. I think the sport has changed a lot. Would you have ever put Mark Mathot on your hockey team as a forward? I, fuck, I let him run the power play. That guy was good. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we'll, we'll let him run the power play for fucking Ed's Hardware in the Men's Sea League. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's, that's enough so bringing on me. Let's move on. Yeah, right. I know. I Listen. Listen, I'm, I was very envious of your career. I really was. As a, def a former defenseman, listen, uh, you know, it, the way you, uh, you know, the way you brought the puck out of the zone and the way you cleared the crease, I, I did enjoy your, your game. I really did. Thanks, brother. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I don't think I missed the camaraderie of hockey. That's the most thing I miss. I miss the boys, you know? Yeah, me yeah. too. I uh, agree. You know, that's, that's a, and, you know, Derek Armstrong said it, you know, you die two deaths. You really do. And when I left hockey, uh, for good, you know, it was like dying, you know, you just got to be reborn, you know, and a lot of guys mm -hmm. have trouble with that. And, uh, I wish that the, uh, NHL and the NHLPA puts more, uh, emphasis on the con the concussions and financial well being of players after they're done. I agree. And well said, uh, last question before we let you go. And I appreciate all your time because it's, I know well, it's I just a pain to, in the ass. That was What's, it was very articulate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it's well done. I'm, I'm going to ruin it now with another question. I didn't want to do it with that. You know, you feel shame. You go to a box and uh, two minutes, but only some uh, American slob would do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the last question is, uh, Jimmy was a very involved owner. So I'm curious of what his speeches were like in the room Uh was it one of those you do not want to disappoint or like, how did he try to motivate? You know, his presence, mm. his look, uh, you know, I got the feeling, you know, when I, I, I would get the vibe from Jimmy and I would try to get to the boys before he did in so many ways, you know, uh, there was a guy that came in and uh, I tell you, this fucking guy was an Adonis. The tape on his stick was perfect. Tape on his shin pads was perfect. I mean, the helmet fit him. The guy was fucking sexy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, he had the hockey ass, the whole fucking thing. And after practice, he came off the ice and uh, I said, you know, listen, I'm going to do this with you. He goes, oh, no, no, I, I, I do not fight. When I told Jimmy that within 20 minutes, I had his equipment in a garbage bag outside the arena. No so, way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so everybody had to step up. Everybody had to step up, right? Yeah. You know, it was a family and you stick up for your family where, you know, that's the mentality that, you know, the Galante family and I had, you know, that, that Jimmy instilled on you also, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But that kid's, uh, that kid's a rich bag. Who's, who's yeah. the player? You don't tell he me anything. Say. He's not sure. He doesn't want to throw him under the bus. I understand that. That's fine. He, yeah, he, he's probably chill trying to play. But listen, hey, when you see yeah. John, tell him I miss him and we miss him here in, in, on the East Coast. Uh, and tell him I always enjoyed his company and his wife's company. They were very gracious people. And, uh, you know, I miss John a lot. You know, you lose, a, you, you know, like he said, you know, you, you some people you never see again after they stop playing, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's doing good. He's like he's like riding horses and stuff in Saskatchewan. Like he's living a different life, but I think he's happy. But I'll let yeah. him know you said hi. Uh, T Bone, yeah. uh, we're gonna let you go. We appreciate your time. This has been a fantastic conversation. I don't even know if you appreciate. I actually 
spent nine dollars in printer ink and put a picture of you uh, behind. I took down the picture of Wayne Gretzky for you. So hey, listen, just go uh, send, yeah. that, send that over and I'll uh, I'll sign it for you. You know, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna ride the wave right now. You know, with all the uh, podcasts and interviews I've been doing, I'm just gonna ride the wave. You know, wait and wait for the movie to come out. I know they're talking to Vin Diesel about playing my role, so uh, you know. <laughs> really? I, uh, I thought I love Charlie it. Savalas I love would it. have been good. Yeah. Well, you know what, Tivo, we're going to call you out on that, and I'm going to send you some stuff. I'd love a sign, something to hang up behind me. That'd be incredible. So if you're cool with it, we'll send you some shit, okay? With or without the, uh, a shirt on, whatever you want. Okay, you got it, brother. Except that big T-bone <laughs> autograph, uh, it's tattoo on the back, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I got I got that done in actually in Fayetteville when I was with the, uh, the, the team down there. A uh, great coach. I'd like to give a shout-out to Tommy Stewart. Out of all the coaches I worked for, Tommy was uh, – he was a player's coach, and, uh, you know, I don't think he got enough recognition, you know, Tom Stewart. Right on. Right on. Right. Perfect. All right, so, boys. Hey, listen. Then how, how did you get your nickname, up? then? How did I get my nickname? Yeah. Dennis Bonvi. Really? Oh. Yeah. I know Dennis. No Would way. Be, I played yeah. against him. He, he's, <laughs> oh, my God. That's hilarious. All right. Um, well, real quick, uh, anybody ask me how I got my nickname, I tell them, uh, you know, because I work so hard in the locker room. You know, I deserve a T-bone steak. But Dennis gave me that nickname. Uh, I came out of the shower and he said, holy fuck, that's bigger than a T-bone steak. <laughs> I shouldn't have asked. <laughs> should not have asked that question. <laughs> Why do I do this? <laughs> T-bone, you take hey. care. Hey, good, yeah, good luck with the uh, the doc. It's been fantastic. Uh, I've watched it a few times and I've appreciated all of it. Like it's, I'm sure there's so much more to be told about this story that it's really good. Yeah, don't forget, you know, Prima Mora Cigar, Cafe and Lounge in uh, in Westchester, New York. You got I'll it. I'll be in. I won't bring that. All right, boys. We'll talk soon. Okay, see you, buddy. See you Take both. care. Thanks, brother. Great interview with T-Bone. Of course, uh, makes me want to go back to our old hashtag, well done. Uh, but anyway, Matt, uh, as we bring in Craig, welcome back to the show. I, I just wanted to know if Craig was in a mob, like what name would he get? I feel like Craig would be like that little, if you guys have ever seen, what's that movie, the Sean Connery, the untouchables. I just watched they're that having the to protect, They're having to protect that like nerdy little bookie, you know, yeah. like they're having to escort him <laughs> to the train station and stuff and everyone's yeah. trying to kill him. I feel yeah. like that's Craig, like the very smart oh. number cruncher that protects all the, uh, the information. I get a cool name like Specs or something, right? Yeah. Like yeah nerdy exactly. glasses. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Uh, Specs is brought to you by FacesBag.ca. Check out their latest issue with Austin Watson. Of course, it also has the last three of them that have all been on our show. Mark Mathot, Nick Paul, Austin Watson. Anyway, uh, Craig, uh, Specs, uh, <laughs> good to see you. I don't know if this will stick, but good to I see you. I hope not. I hope no, not. I that's that's all good. Uh, yeah, <laughs> boys, that was, first off, that was a great interview. Uh, that was a, a fun one for me to edit because uh, of the... <laughs> power outage halfway through and various connection issues on and off but uh all in all like a lot of fun uh i noticed that our snack our cheat snack question didn't get asked <laughs> and i wanted to figure out what do you guys think he would have said it well first off brent i i, I know why you didn't ask him because i think he would have got a, a a bit of a verbal abuse following that but yeah what do you think his cheat snack would have been any guesses See, here's the thing i so i thought of this during the interview and i'm like well i'm not going because if he says like goji berries I won't yeah. know how to no. get out of that, right? No. But my guess is he'll just say cigar. Yeah, that that yeah. dude, I was going to say, he chews on cigars yeah. when he's not smoking them. That's yeah. probably yeah. a key snack. Yeah, you, know what, you know what we should point out, by the way, is that interview took about five hours. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it started in his car through, I don't know where, New York, and then it couldn't get connection. Well, he was driving. Up, yeah, he was driving to Brooklyn, and, yeah. and people aren't really going to see that. And we kept trying to have a normal discussion with T-Bone, <laughs> but he was driving while filming himself yeah. on a Zoom call yeah. through, like, New York. And I'm yeah. like, oh, God. And it was it kept cutting out. <laughs> Obviously, all these underpasses, and there's a lot of, you know, traffic and whatnot. But anyway, we finally sorted it out. The yeah. sheer panic that I'm going through watching this, trying to figure out how I'm going to edit this, where, like, he's, oh, I was just like, okay. Yeah. It, anyways, it, we rescheduled. He, we got him somewhere <laughs> sitting down, and it yeah. worked out much better. But there was a few little things in there. Uh, um 
Well, anyway, so buddy, I had a couple questions that I wanted to kind of follow up with you guys on based off of that. I really enjoyed the doc. I enjoyed all the untold ones. Um, but this one, this one obviously hits home for us because it's hockey and everything else. Uh, one of the things that Meth that you brought up actually, and I'm going to ask both of you guys, this is obviously he messed with the opposing teams a lot. Uh, what, what road trip team building or whatever, did you have the worst like pre-game experience in? And Brad, oh, I'm going to hit man. you with this one too. Cause I mean, I know I've had to work out of some rinks with no internet and everything else. And, uh, but is there one that you're just like, this is the showers are terrible. The food is all whatever. Is there one that well, you're just like, that's the most miserable one? In the Amer- yeah. In the American league, it would have been Binghamton. So when I was playing yeah. in Syracuse, we would always play against Ottawa senators farm team, which yeah. happened to be in Binghamton. And um, it was just, I found, I thought I found it was a dump. Like I, I just, the, the dressing room was very dumpy and the food was always brutal after the game, but that's the American league. And at the mm-hmm. time I'm a young player, I don't know any better. And then, uh, and I think at the NHL level, I think Washington and not because it's the building's fine, everything's fine, but their showers it, a lot like Detroit's old building. It felt like, like a prison shower where there's one big column with a bunch of shower heads. Uh, so we're all within like a four foot radius showering in cold water. And it's like tearing off your skin because of the pressure. It was just, and, and, and both those rinks were equally as bad. So I'll say that, but otherwise, you know, I'm not going to be a prima donna here for the most part, things were pretty good. Those column showers too. They're brutal for eye contact because <laughs> everybody's just saying. facing each like, other. It's like, <laughs> it's like, where are you looking, right? You're looking at three other guys literally at, like within arm's length. Right. Yeah. So. <laughs> Bro, what about you? You got a you got a bad uh, road yeah, trip. Yeah, how many city shower or... stories? Um, <laughs> I do. The igloo in Pittsburgh was one of the worst buildings, and you yeah, can attest to the the visiting room was atrocious. Like mm-hmm. the guy that sat right behind the door as it opened would nearly get killed every game because <laughs> that door would swing right into you. I I never understood the igloo, and yeah, that one was tough. Uh, yeah. Carolina was always tough and cold to get around. Carolina's got that wind tunnel thing where. My yes. tie would literally Carolina is sit straight out. Yeah, it's wild. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Chicago was always difficult. One, they would just never tell you which door to use to get into the building half the time. Okay. But they wouldn't give you at the until they did the renovation thing. Uh, we used to carry a lot of gear and it's now gotten smaller, but you would have to carry like nine cases of stuff down about two flights of stairs. And there'd be an elevator over there, like, no, no, you can't use that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, that's humping stuff in my suit like do these hands look like a lot of manual labors happen no, no. so no. you didn't have to show so, me them i could have told you without looking yeah, exactly. <laughs> so yeah no uh, i never liked chicago uh, just a, it was tough to work around okay all right that's good uh something that kind of popped up in this one and maybe you guys got a story about it but what's the most danbury thing you've seen with your own eyes it could be at the american league it could be what's something that's oh. like dumb over the top stupid that you're just like that's ridiculous what's well, the- that's that's simple. That's the, uh, that's the Leaf Sen series. Every time it seemed to be like, like one is you got Curtis Joseph taking down Mick Magoo in a playoff series, right? And there's no penalty call on that whatsoever. Mm-hmm. But the other one is all of a sudden you look over and Travis Green is in the bench and Darcy Tucker's fighting at the boards with the bench and Chris Neal's hammering away. Like that's, that's the stuff that I kind of miss, although not a big proponent of fighting, but just that all out gong show or at least a game a season always seems to be yeah what you look for, right like you just fair. yeah that intensity of nonsense or i even think of ray emery fighting in buffalo yeah yeah, yeah i think i think for me i think for me it would just go back to my syracuse stories like i still remember kanaka um we were had it we had to win like you know 17 out of our last 20 games or something stupid like that to make the, the postseason and uh Kanaka decides it's a good idea to, to bring in a hammer and chisel and so we would select a player of the game after the game of course and you know we're sitting in an old dressing room so it's not drywall behind you or wood it's it's just like stone right and so uh like these big stone blocks so of course we'll pick the, the who we thought was player of the game amongst each other and that player had to chisel the number you know one or two or three depending on you know all the way up to 17 so like I after a couple games our, our trainer, like, God bless him, was just livid, right? He's losing his marbles at this point. His name was Rodney. And Rodney was not a happy camper to begin with on a day-to-day basis. He was always grumpy. I was terrified to go ask Rods for a stick when I had, like, none left upstairs. And, and so Kanopka does not care what Rodney thinks, of course, because it's Kanopka. And he's a beauty, of course. I'm not chirping him because I'm afraid he'd show up at my house tomorrow morning. But in any case... He has, he gets into a confrontation with Rodney and they're arguing back and forth. And before you know it, our team captain, Zen and Kanopka 
has Rodney pinned up against the wall by his neck and they're arguing and Z's threatening to kill him. And so that's just one small incident among many that we had in Syracuse that year that I look back and I think none of this shit would ever have been acceptable nowadays, but we went through it and it certainly made my, uh, well, it opened my eyes. We'll leave it at that. Okay. You know what, by the way, Zenin Kanopka now is an uh, associate coach. He's like helping out. So I guess not an associate coach, but he's in Niagara with the ice dogs. Good he's for him. Hey, hey, yeah, yeah. And he's a beauty. Like the guy can <laughs> the players love him, buddy. He would, he would grab me in practice. Like they had me paired up with this Russian player that we had brought up. He was pretty young and I was getting frustrated with him during pregame skate because I'm young and I'm trying to be, you know, leave an impression. And I feel like, you know, playing with this guy who they had me paired up with was not helping me. And he was screwing up all these drills and pregame skate. Z got angry with me because I was, you could tell my body language wasn't great. And he called me out in front of the whole team on the ice, like grabbed me. And like woke me up and says, come on, like get your head out of your ass type of thing. And I didn't like it, but it was a good learning experience. So again, when I'm telling these Kanopka stories, I want to make it clear. Probably one of the better captains I've ever had. Yeah, uh, he okay. is on the guest list. So that'd, that'd be, be a good one, I think. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll just save this part. We'll yeah. have we'll have to bring him on with Morasti because I can get Johnny on here, too. So uh, yeah. it'll be interesting. Sure, we can have a reunion. Um, yeah. a name that's come up on our podcast a couple of times is Brommer. Like the Sens have that. I don't know if he's their equipment manager. I don't know. What Brommer's a legend. Is. He's like a dressing room attendant. Yeah. yeah, sure. He's their equipment attendant guy, whatever. He's always buzzing around. Does anyone yeah. have a, a Brommer story they want to drop or, or tell people who he is or kind of whatever? He's just, I mean, he's, can, he's come up a few times. Yeah. He's a very gregarious figure, uh, in the, in the Ottawa senators locker room. He's a younger guy, uh, works with the equipment guys. And he'll literally do anything for you. And I believe he's from Carp Elmont yeah. and he's proud of it. He'll yeah. remind you that he's from oh, out yeah. there. And uh, he's unapologetic about that. Wally can add more, but it's just, just a really good guy. Anything you ever needed. He's always got a smile on his face. I don't think I've ever seen him upset once or mad. He's just happy to be there. And when you have equipment managers and trainers that have that attitude, it makes life way more enjoyable for the team. It's contagious. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and the hardest working guy I've ever seen in that room bar none like he if you need something done it just yeah. gets done and um i saw him geez a month ago uh, in in carp by the way and uh i was like brommer you're in like every this is the one guy that's been mentioned in more shows than yeah. any other that we've done and he's like i know so um i told him uh we're gonna have him on for one show oh, we definitely should have a chat awesome. with him and see what's awesome. up with brommer because yeah. that I, he knows where bodies are buried i'm sure of it <laughs> He's one of those guys, man. He's always there. You know what I mean? Like yeah. he's there when you skate, he's there when you're not sitting. There's all, they're all like that too. Like Alex and Coxie and yeah. Johnny and all like those guys are. All the su- dudes. Oh my God. Just the best. Uh, right. Like I think that's one of the things that a lot of people say, right. Once, once you leave, he's, that's a crew that and, and the training staff too. Like those, those agreed. are some of the best, best in the league. Right. That's why they get asked to go to team Canada and stuff. So Ottawa is very, very fortunate. They have some really good people working within the organization. For yeah. sure. I was just going to say like, you don't get to play or go for team Canada unless you are a good to be around first of all, and really good at your job. And so for Johnny forget for Alex and for uh, Dom and all the guys that, and uh, that went, um, you just know how good they are to be at the world championship. So yep. uh, that, that is a really, really good room. For sure. Yeah. Kind of sticking with the Ottawa senators here. Is there a current or former Ottawa senator that you would add that you think would fit right in to that Oh five Oh six Danbury Trashers team. Like who, oh, who, who would they add? A there's current, a lot, there's a current cur- Ottawa cur- senator? Current or former? Who do you oh. think it is? Well, I mean, oh, Brian McGratton. Brian yeah, McGratton's like, a good one. But I mean, pick your poison, right? Like it could be Chris, Chris Neal. Neal. Neiler could easily have played on that team because he, he could score, he could yeah. play, and he can fight. So, I mean, any any former tough guy, I'm sure you could add to that mix. Ray Emery, of Rob course. Rob Ray. Ooh, yeah. Rob Ray. Yeah. Ray Emery would be a good one, too. So yeah, just as a goalie, but also that. would yeah. fight occasionally, and you know he would have. So. Yeah. Anyway, well, okay. you could uh, Patrick Laline. Don't you remember the time? Isn't he the one that gets to the bench and is trying to get the equipment guys to get his blocker off so he can go? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a few, but like Brian McGratton to me will always be, I want to say, the scariest figure Ottawa's had as a fighter. Yeah, he was just, he was scary, like just playing because I remember playing against him a little in the American League too. And um, cause once I made it to the NHL, I think he was kind of coming to an end a little bit at the NHL level, but, yeah. um, man, like he was terrifying, like oh. to his credit. And I heard he was a, I heard he's an unbelievable guy. 
Um, but yeah, like on the ice, when you'd see him skating around, he was so big and imposing. He had that scary looking face, that mug on him. I just, yeah. not a guy you'd want to cross paths with. He and I had some good chats in the room. Just, you know, he's one of those that would just sit and talk. I really enjoyed when Brian McGrath awesome. was around. Another guy uh, would fit in perfect that I think we need to get a little below the NHL level with like Pat Jablonski, who taught MMA to the Ottawa Senators <laughs> during training camp one season. Right. Would you have was it, with wait? Him? Are you talking about Jeremy Jablonski? Oh, maybe it's Jeremy. Yeah, yeah, Jer yeah. Sorry. Yeah, like yeah, because him and Morasti. I mean, people if people are like out there and they're still still listening. <laughs> Google John Morasti <laughs> and Jeremy Jablonski. Oh my goodness, it is. They're just literally trading face shots. It's pretty pretty good. Yeah, he, so he'd be one. Anyway. Yeah. yeah, maybe even another another guy I'd love to get on the show, Yarko Rutu. I think he would have fit in right there. That guy was an absolute pest out there. I love him. Yeah, I'm I never to had track the pleasure. Him down. Yeah, yeah, that's when he was. A, he was one of the. He tormented me in the locker room. <laughs> that's another so, reason why I want to get him on. <laughs> I would. He's like, yeah. I'm like, damn you, Yarko, beat it. And he would talk about. So in Finland, I don't want to. I, but in Finland, you have to do a year's service in the military, and so he did his at the Finnish international airport, doing like nothing, right? So he always jokes about his year of manning the airport. Anyway, yeah, I we'll, remember. Uh, Mark, we'll, I was gonna say Marcus Nurmi. I remember he told he, he told us a story one time about when he got to fire rocket launchers. Like during his year of training <laughs> yeah. stuff, and like, yeah. that's pretty cool. Like most most uh, NHL prospects don't get to do that. No, they do joke about it because they all have to go through uh, it anyway. So we'll have them on for sure. Yeah, for sure. Uh, okay, just a couple of little small things before we get to trivia here that I want to wrap up with. Uh, we're talking about the Netflix doc, uh, Untold Crime and Penalties. I just want to know real quick, what's your Netflix etiquette here, boys? How how long do you death scroll before you give up? What's the time frame that you'll just endlessly, mindlessly scroll to watch something before you give up? Oh, I'm not long at all. Okay. I'm yeah, like, I mean, either. I'm probably I'm pretty, two minutes at most. Yeah, okay. I think I'm I'm such a lunatic that I'm already planned ahead as far as what I'm going to watch. So I <laughs> everything is just, I'm so pragmatic with it when it comes to Netflix because I hate scrolling like that. So yeah, I mean, I usually have a good idea what I want to watch before I turn it on. Okay, well, maybe maybe you guys can help people out. Do you guys have a non-sports Netflix recommendation you could make to people? That's something yeah, that watched, you've watched recently that you liked. Oh man, I forget. Well. Last it doesn't time, have to be Netflix too. If you guys last wanted. time my wife and I watched a movie called The Horizon Line. Uh, it's it was on uh, Prime on Amazon Prime, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a it's just a it's a quick ninety two minute movie about a couple down in the Mauritius down in Mauritius I believe, which is just right off the coast of Madagascar, and uh, I think they get stuck on an airplane. It's a survival movie where they're stuck on a plane over water. Pilot gets a heart attack, and it's a small prop plane, and they have to figure out how to survive. So I'll leave it at that. It was pretty good. It's called The Horizon Line. Okay, um, this is probably a good time for a confession. Uh, uh -oh. Do you guys watch Ted Lasso? No. Wow, I'm shocked. I don't like it, so I need you two to go look. My family loves it, and everybody else seems to love it. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm not a fan. I so, hate. I hate comedies. I'm not a comedy guy. Like, I, I just, I can't do it anymore. Have you watched uh, our I, show? Like, they've just changed so much, and not only that, but I just. I like like dramatic movies or, or action yeah, movies, yeah, like, like, yeah. you know, like thrillers. Yeah. I just I sit to sit down and watch a comedy sitcom or a show. It's just like, to me, it's a waste of time. Again, I know that's unpopular. All right. Well, okay. So you guys have to watch at least one episode. That's your homework. You got to watch one episode. What's that? It's on Apple, isn't it? Like, yeah. Apple yeah, TV. Yeah. You guys can come over if you don't have it and come watch it. Uh, I think I'll pass. Oh, yeah. We'll all sit around and watch a comedy together. <laughs> <laughs> Let's binge the series, boys. <laughs> this, this might be a whole podcast. Yeah. yeah there all you right. Go. I'll shut up. Yeah, no, that's pretty much that's pretty much all I had today, boys, as far as that stuff. I loved that the untold one. Uh, just like Matt mentioned, I think the I, that boxing one's unreal. The tennis yeah. one that the, with Rodney and, and, and Fish you is can't really go wrong. good. Yeah, I, I don't. How many do you guys know how many they're doing? Because I they're like, done I'm, like five. So yeah, far, I, right? I think it's up to six. Yeah, oh, it is. Well, there you go. Yeah, okay. like no, they're really good. There's, there's a Tom Fish Brady one. Really good. There's a Tom Brady one coming up to ESPN in November. I know. Yeah, that. that's yeah, but with with regard, the untold ones are awesome though because. These are all stories that are relatively like for me, at least other than of course, Caitlyn Jenner, but like, yeah, I, for the most part, there are a lot of people that I really are not very familiar with. So it's just yeah. like, you have no idea what's happening going into it. And I think that makes it more interesting and, and enjoyable to watch. Yeah, absolutely. Oh yeah. I didn't know any of them. Right. No. Like I, sh I should remember Marty fish, but I, I don't like vaguely. Yeah. Well, and that, the well, that, that Caitlyn Jenner one, like, like I didn't realize how talented like Bruce yeah. Jenner was 
yeah. in that time yeah, period when it came to just everyday, just athleticism. Like, oh, like I know he's a decathlete and you're like, duh, like you're a decathlete, you're good at everything. But like they show him water skiing and uh, doing wheelies on an ATV. I'm like, oh my God. Flying like, a plane. Yeah, oh, yeah it, flying a plane. I mean, yeah, like, racing what? cars. Crazy. Yeah. So yeah, cool no. to watch. Yeah. The footage they had too, like that's the I didn't listen. I I, I was I wasn't born yet. I didn't know. I, I know he won the decathlon. I didn't know how. So, but the fact that yeah. they had all that and, that extra behind the scenes foot, like unreal. And a, and, and a lot of these 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 special people, they all share a very common theme, and it's they're they're just relentless and their obsession with being the best in their craft. Like you saw you saw uh, Bruce Jenner, like he he dedicated every single day, seven days a week for roughly three and a half years for the Olympic Games. And it's the same as MJ and everybody else that we watch in these documentaries. They're just absolutely obsessed with their craft. And I, I think as, as anybody watching that, whether you're an athlete or not, you admire that, right? And it's, it's, it's really something that can motivate you with your everyday life. Okay, here's a question, Matt, because you, you would have had to dedicate an awful lot of time to get where you are because it's a very small group that make it to professional yeah. sports. So is it worth the payoff? I know it's going to sound really silly, but worth the payoff yeah. of missing out on so much stuff as a kid yeah. to get where you get to as an adult. I think so. I think so. I think, well, my dad's philosophy was always very much, you know, especially having two boys and he was a police officer. He believed in be, keeping us very busy. And I'm talking like swimming, baseball, soccer, hockey, you name it. I did everything. And, it, and from his perspective, it was just keeping us out of trouble with extracurriculars after school and keeping us focused on different tasks. I missed out on a lot of stuff, you know, like high school, especially in high school. I think that's yeah. where I really noticed it. I missed out on a lot of parties on the weekends and, you know, gatherings and stuff like that. Uh, but I was also a, an obsessed kid when it came to training and, and skating. You know, I was leaving myself little post-it notes above my door and I was, you know, no one was telling me to do that, but I was doing that when I was 14, 15 as a reminder in the summers to work very hard, what my goals were. So, I mean, it takes a personality. Not every player I'm sure was like that. I was like that. Was it worth it? I think so. I mean, I have so many great memories from, from sports growing up that, you know, missing the odd party here and there, I made up for that. You know, like at the pro level, I made up for it tenfold. So, I mean, I'm not complaining. Um, do you think that variety of, like, playing different sports is – because a lot of kids now, like, to, they, they think to make the NHL, you've got to play hockey uh, all year round. How much of that do you think being an athlete – helps right. as opposed and, to and it's hard player. to say right it's a good question it's 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 an actually in fact it's an excellent question because there's a lot of parents out there i'm a new parent my kids slowly going to start getting into hockey wally has been through this now with his son I, I i'm not sure what the right answer is i'd like to think that exploring different sports and not obsessing over one specific sport for a full year at a time is probably the way to go like i like the idea that my kid is an athlete and not just a one trick pony yeah. uh, and, and no offense to anybody that decides to do that maybe that's the way to go now it's so competitive the landscape that you probably can't afford to let your kid off for four months out of the year just to do other things but i'm not going to take the route with my son that i believe he needs to skate and be on the ice every day i want to make sure that he's playing different sports he's he's trying out different things I don't want to be that crazy parent, you know, yelling and screaming at his kid because he had a tough practice. I think it's very important that your kid has an opportunity to try different things. You're, it's, a, it's a different landscape nowadays. I understand that. But it's also very important for your kid to learn, be around different people, mm -hmm. different organizations. So that'll be my approach. Okay. So here's a different take on that. One is I completely agree to doing different sports, but my son doesn't want to. So and that's... He, and yeah, but the, here, so and I'm like Ryan, like, and he, he did play some touch football or flag football for a, right. a couple of summers, but I can't get him to play a different sport. So well, he's he only want he's like I only want to do this. Like you can ask yeah. me to play soccer, but I don't want to do it. That's good though, Wally. Yeah. So, so I feel like, but but there is a huge part of the perception is, and, and Wayne Gretzky is a big proponent of it, and I agree doing different different stuff will change different muscle functions and right. We'll work on different things, but I just can't get him to do it. If it's well, workout, and it's yeah, but he won't do anything. He won't play another sport. Yeah. So there's two things to that first. Great. Good for him that he like, he's enjoying it. That means you obviously did a great job and you didn't push him too much. And at the same time to touch on the multi-sport thing, I think, I think there's a, there, I think the healthy balance is that you be, when you're an athlete, you'll just, you'll excel that much easier at that one specific sport that you decide to fully immerse yourself in once you get into your teens, where 
you develop all these natural skill sets and your ability to learn new things on the ice really is improved when you're out there learning new skills like baseball, soccer, yeah. swimming, whatever it else, whatever it is. So I think it is important to let your kid experiment a little bit with other stuff. But again, I guess it comes down to, does your kid want to? And if he doesn't want to, you don't want to push him. And he's offered to play any sport he wants. Yeah. You just can't get him to do yeah, well, it. So it is it's, what it is. Yeah, it's something it's that Chris Schwartz, I'm, I've talked to him like at lengths about it. Like he, uh, I, he told me a story about uh, the first time, one of the first times he worked with Daniel Alfredson, one of the things they had him do was throw a football. And yeah. Alfie couldn't really do it. Like it oh. kind of ducked a little bit, but next year he came back and he was throwing perfect spirals. Yeah. And it's yeah. Just... The, Swedes, the Swedes are terrible. Like, yeah. like you watch them throw a ball and you're like, Oh my God. Yeah. Just, the technique is brutal, but you're right. Uh, like, like, and Schwartzy, the strength coach, Chris Schwartz of the Ottawa senators, he's great for that. He found a really good formula in that you don't need to bury players after games with these ridiculous workouts to worry about keeping up with your strength. He's, he's figured out a nice little way where, you know, he can maintain muscle yet, you know, still recover. He's big in athletic movement. So in the summertime, when you train with them and he does that with all the sends guys, especially leading up to camp, you're playing all these ball games. So like we would play ball sports at the sense plex on the turf before practices where we'd be playing dodgeball or soccer or football and we'd play for a while and it got competitive and guys like Chris Neal, of course, you'd have to make sure you were either on his team or just not anywhere in his vicinity because <laughs> he'll kill you. But, but that's just, but that's, that's Schwartz's philosophy. It's just a lot of running athletic sports, good for your hand eye coordination. And that should apply to your kids for parents listening. That, that stuff is so important. And I can't stress that enough ball sports, just, you know, you that hand eye and improving that will only make your, your son or your daughter a better player on the ice. Yeah, absolutely. Totally. Hey, Brent, you know what your son could do? Maybe if he wins this trivia, he could do a little uh, puck luck from Gong Show. Because we're giving away, for Trivial Trivia today, presented by Gong Show, we're giving away another puck luck game. We've given away a couple recently. People love these things. I love these things, messing around with them. Like we mentioned on our live show, we had the uh, sauce-off game at a golf tournament. That didn't go so great for me, but I think other people did good. Um, but anyway, so if you haven't won one yet, here's another opportunity. Uh, we got a great question for you today. Coming from the Untold documentary, sort of. Uh, the question is, who is the all-time leader in penalty minutes for the Danbury Trashers? If you know the answer to that question, head on over to Twitter. Use the hashtag Wally Mathot, and be sure to tag at Gong Show Gear on Twitter, and we're going to reveal the winner on our next show. Nice. We should be on Monday. So until then, gentlemen, have yourselves a great weekend. We'll see you soon. Uh, that's the Wally Mathot Show. Time for us to drive on out of here. I got all day for you guys especially a guy that played defense and he looked like a fucking, uh, you know, pylon out there. The way that you guys went around. <laughs> uh, I don't even know how to defend myself right now. Okay. So I'll just, I won't say shit. You, know, you don't, you don't, you know why? Cause you got to start your car in the morning. So. <laughs> <laughs>